Hello, everybody, and welcome to our movie talk on Diego Maradona, part of Cinema Significa. Uh, I am Anthony DeSanctis, programming manager here at ArtsQuest and lead programmer of the Frank Banco Alehouse Cin Cinemas. Uh, thank you so much uh, for joining us for this. Uh, and we are going to talk about, yes, the documentary Diego Maradona. Uh, I would like to welcome our uh, curators of this series. Please welcome Alessandra Finelli and Francisco Aguilar. Hello, hello. Hello. Thanks for, for having us. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yeah. Hi, Franny. How you doing? I'm good. How are you? Good. Um, all right. So, you know, um, I I guess how 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 do you want to start this? I mean, Franny, you're the one who was like really preaching this documentary, you know. Um, I knew nothing about it. I mean, this is you're both gonna make fun of me because how uh, much I love sports ball. Um, but like, you know, through osmosis <laughs> and stuff. Sports. Yeah. Through osmosis, like I know about some obviously football players and other major athletes and stuff throughout history. Um, Diego Maradona, I heard his names, I heard his name a million times, but I'm going to be quite frank. I never knew quite when he when he lived. Um, so, yeah. So like the other day when, when we were discussing maybe when to do this, you know, uh, I said, well, is he playing? And Franny's like, no, he's not playing. Yeah, and I felt like a real dingus, but yeah. So, Franny, I really kind of want to thank you for just introducing me to him. And it's funny because it's one of these things where I've heard his name since knowing who he is now. I feel like just in the last few weeks have seen and heard him everywhere. Maybe it's because of soccer and football and everything going on right now, but he's just kind of everywhere. And I don't even mean just because we're doing this. So, mm -hmm. yeah. But anyway, why did we want to do this movie? That's Let me ask you guys that. Why did we want to have this discussion? um uh, well i don't know i I really i mean the movie itself is just so it's so good you know and it was and there's not like when you think of sports films and documentary there's not really much on soccer so I, like i really think this is documentary is just like a really great documentary and the fact that it's on soccer and then diego maradona too who he's not even like just an athlete i mean in the documentary you see how much of an impact he's had on two different cultures you know in Argentina, but then also in Italy. And I think, I don't know, that shows kind of like the power of not just him, but soccer in general, you know, because I think especially in America, people don't understand why it's so big. Like, why does everyone watch it? And I think through this, you kind of get a little glimpse, you know, especially when he arrives there and like the city, Napoli, who they were struggling for so long. And as soon as they started seeing a little bit of him, like getting fame and like rising and the team growing, they were like, oh, he's kind of just like us. He's just like one of the kids from like the neighborhood. And, and you know, that kind of shows like, I don't know, I guess hope, I guess I'll like, oh, you can just kind of be good at something and slowly rise up. Yeah. Sure. And just kind of to piggyback off of that, you know, in, in the specific films and per, and, you know, movie talks, TV shows that we've kind of discussed in this series in Cinema Significa, I think it was also really important to both of us that we kind of go into the sector of sports and football just due to the cultural impact that it has specifically on Latin America. But just being able to watch, and we'll talk about this, a fantastic piece that is deep diving into footage that, you know, hasn't really been discussed for lots of reasons. Um, on Diego Maradona and just how seeing him as this cultural global phenomenon even and just seeing like it's almost like what happens when you put someone on this pedestal that really no one should be should be put on um obviously there's there's lots of contention around like his political and obviously the, the all the scandalous stuff going on with his life what I appreciated the most about this documentary is that it truly I thought it, it really just took a glimpse into this, like Franny was saying, his his time in Italy, Napoli is, uh, in Naples and his impact on that. And then it kind of just isolated it into like his life before that and his life after that, kind of just focusing on, again, this like phenomena that was him, this uh this godlike, you know, there was a quote, we were just talking about this when, you know, this is obviously later on in his career and he was being interviewed and, and they're talking about people disrespecting him. And he was said something along the lines of just like, people can't disrespect me because when you disrespect me, you're disrespecting God. And so it's, it's just this complex and this ego, but at the same time, 
the success and the accolades. And it was, it's truly amazing to see how that all kind of fell on one person, but then obviously we see what, what, what happened with him and why maybe you shouldn't necessarily do that. But um, I was super excited. I, with my personal background and my family in Peru, even though we don't need to talk about the Peruvian soccer team, um, I love women's soccer or football. So uh, yeah, this just kind of seemed like a no brainer. It was totally Franny's idea though, to kind of uh, at least start a conversation surrounding this athlete. And it just worked out that I think this came out in 2019, but I think 2020 was kind of when people were talking about it. So um, yeah. Uh, yeah. What, what did, what did you both think about the actual film in itself? Because I think when you're when you have someone like Diego Maradona, you, you, so many different angles it could have could have gone. I think Anthony, you even said something about the approach to this narrative and storytelling was so unique and so palatable because it wasn't a lot of talking heads in interviews. It was footage and just sound bites, which I definitely appreciated. Yeah. But I wanted to hear what y'all thought about that. Well, did you ever see? Uh, so yeah, the film came out in 2019, I believe, got like a theatrical release everywhere else including like the uk i think it was nominated for a bafta for best documentary but in the us got a max hbo max like direct to streaming um from what i read online like you know the director who made this film was like trying to figure out how to tell the story of maradona and then eventually landed on naples which is awesome um but the film kind of reminded me in a sense of have, have you ever seen also on HBO Max, uh, I wonder if it's the same director. Uh, the Princess with uh, about Princess Diana. Do you know that film? Oh, um, that actually kind of sounds familiar. That it might be the same director, but sorry, continue. Well, no, no. So on, it's the same approach, though. Like, there's no interviews. There's like, there's no talking heads. You may hear a voiceover here and there, but it's just footage telling the story. You are along with you are along with Diego for the ride. You know, uh, and a wild ride it is. So. Uh, I really liked it, especially, I mean, honestly, though, like, this is my first exposure to him, um, like, for real. But there's a quote that someone says in the movie that has, like, stayed with me. And it's, what is it? Someone describes Diego, I think, as a bit of genius, no, a, a bit of cheating and a lot of genius or something like that. Do you remember this line? Like, I yeah. just found it fascinating. Yeah, because it's, it's during the, when I think... When they're playing England, I think they're in the semifinals, and he he has a handball, and it's just like he they mentioned that's his cheating, but then in the same game he scores a really incredible goal from when he takes the ball from midfield, and they're like, and there's the genius, like it's just, yeah. That kind of gets into I know for anyone to kind of talk about this, but this dichotomy and duality within his identity, um, kind of like the concept of alter egos. I think it was his personal trainer who in in the documentary I, I think i think he's kind of like citing it the most he basically was he was saying there's diego and there's maradona diego was this fun loving boy and this person and he's in it for the fun i absolutely love the footage of like little diego and he had the number 10 on his back that was very very um emotional it, it resonated with me so I, again i i think th it was very successful in this narrative and storytelling with the specific shots that, that were chosen i think the sound bites matched up great it was it was like anthony said <clears throat> excuse me just following diego along with for the ride but then he was saying you know maradona like entirely different ballpark like he demanded respect he th th that was the pressure that was the fame that was the ego he could not mess up and the irony of it is that whenever we saw all these big events happening in the news or, you know, like, oh, he's upset now because for the first time since they, they, they mandated this, like he's going to be tested for drugs or whatever. Mm -hmm. um, they, always, they were like, that's not, that was him, this mad, you know, like that, that's what was happening. The violence, and we, we were talking about this in the Barcelona fight with the epic sound bites, which I, I don't know if that was edited in post or if that was just yeah, live, right. just him karate <laughs> kicking people. And that's all the impact. It was just insane. But, and then it would just go back to Diego. And it's like, th these are two different people. It's very, I don't want to say Jekyll Hyde, but that's yeah. what kind of came to mind when I, when I was experiencing that. But um, Brandy, what else did you want to talk about with the the concept of alter egos in, in this film? Uh, yeah, there's like a, a couple of things. I mean, Currently, I am reading a book called The Alter Ego Effect. So I have like already found the interesting. And and then recently, there's also the movie Hitman, Richard Linklater's Hitman, which kind of goes into this. 
And then also personally, I mean, like everyone calls me Franny, but I've kind of always had different nicknames. And that is something like that. It has been with purpose. And I didn't really realize that until I first watched this documentary, how like that is something I was kind of obviously not to the level of that, but it is something like me at home versus me when I'm outside, I do switch into different, like if I'm Fran, Franny or Francisco, or like my parents call me Frank. And it's, I don't know when I saw like that Maradona does that, I was like, oh yeah, I completely understand. Like you do need to like switch. And especially like, I guess it's now giving some backstory on me, but like seeing how he comes from like a completely different culture and then he went so quickly to fame and like it's a completely different like I've connected to that because I I don't know I was from like Patterson New Jersey and then I was in Allentown and then when I moved to a little bit more like suburban area I was like wow I have to like kind of really adapt and it was hard to like do that transition but picking up a nickname made it easy you know it was like what would this person do and it's something I've always kind of slided into and I was I don't know I found that interesting and I wondered if it's also like a cultural thing because I feel like a lot of Hispanic people always have nicknames and it's not, and it's, and it's something that does stay with you as you grow up, you know, it's like, it kind of always reminds you like, this is younger you, like you're kind of always this, you know? That's so interesting because I, and I also think like, obviously half of my identity and my family are white and Italian American and their half are in Peru. But it's so interesting that you say that because like I obviously use different nicknames. I'm called something different from my family in Peru, but they actually, um, it's 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 a little bit more than just like oh this is just a short name. It's it's more uh not just like a term of endearment. It really almost is like a separate identity. Like, you know, Luis and Lucho and Cesar and Chueco, yeah. you know, or Carlos and Chueco, um, Cesar and Cheche. You know, that's that's really that's really cool that you mentioned and tie that into, um, Hispanic and Latin identity because. I, I wonder how much of that would have been present in his life without obviously like the fame and attention surrounding his, his career and whatnot. But for sure, I totally see, especially since, you know, when he came to Naples, like th th this is a person not of this culture, not of this identity. One of my favorite parts in this was um the, I think I don't, I might've, whoever was was behind the table with him defending him against the reporters like how dare you ask such a stupid question get out and they throw him out and everyone's just cheering okay. then he goes up to the pitch and then he's like buona sera napoletano that was just so <laughs> epic to me that like he wasn't the one losing his cool he was just kind of like huh? and everyone was like how dare you like that's my son like it, it was so um and i feel like that almost created like that 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 was if, if there was ever a moment that I was like okay where's the pedestal it's like he, he's right here but just not even allowing people to have this space to insult him for having this dissonance between the cultural identities they were just like he's here and we're doing it meanwhile then I think that the next sound bite or maybe right before it Diego was like yeah no one else would buy me so <laughs> like um here we are um and or he would just like Barcelona was was not so great and like well, what are you hoping from naples and he's like respect it wasn't even like you know like i hope like for success he cited that you know i asked for a house i got an apartment i asked for a ferrari i got a fiat so he was like they downgraded me or they downsized me it was that was you know and he but, had to be um, the breadwinner for his family like at 15 in that apartment like you know i'm sorry i mean to cut you off but like I, that was just like man what pressure like and for a kid you know sorry insane pressure that and that was the whole the whole thing like the at first i didn't know what was happening because that was when the sound bite with the physical the personal trainer rather was talking saying there's diego and there's maradona he was like grabbing his throat and i was like what is and i, I guess he was just checking his pulse because i guess that was a more accurate way to do it and to I guess keeping people in their target heart rate. I'm not really sure it was the 80s, but um just that baby. I was like, is he choking him right now? Like, what is happening? Um, so yeah, like that that whole just pressure. And you know, you're literally seeing just like physically push himself to the limits. And then immediately after that, it was a sequence of him just continually getting knocked down. And it was like the opening match, and it was just not great. Just like down, down, down. And you don't, you know, you would think that they wouldn't even be focusing on that necessarily, especially when they're highlighting that part of his career. But sorry, my cat. Um, but um, yeah, it was it was really, it was really unique. And I valued it. I thought it was really, really cool. Yeah. Yeah, no, and it's interesting, like now, like just now I realized because you were mentioning how 
what he was expecting when he got to Napoli. And that makes me think, like, it's kind of, it kind of shows how almost bad of a person I think he is because I think he purposely made Maradona his bad side because that shows he was kind of looking for a way to, like, to do that, you know, for, like, the fame and, like, all these, like, material stuff. And the second that he realized that he can kind of have a dual identity, he was like, oh, all of my bad thoughts, all of my bad impulses, I don't have to deal with it or, like, I can just throw it onto Maradona, you know? And it's... But I, I like that, too, because there's never, like, the movie, since it's no, like, talking heads or anything, it's just observing. And it's, you're never judging, you know? You're kind of just like, wow. And, you know, we already mentioned that he was... 15 when he kind of took over everything so it's also like you can just pick up like yeah of course a, a 15 year old never learned how to like grow up he was kind of just forced to be an adult at 15 so yeah and he ends up like you know doing cocaine he has like mob connections and stuff like wow yeah and imagine that jump from i mean i feel like we all feel a crazy jump when you go from like high school jobs to like a normal more stable job and imagine from literally living with your entire family in a little shed to having multi-million dollars like that's a yeah. jump income that you just can't how do you handle that we've seen that happen with however many pop stars right and and just like well i had to grow up in front of you all like, you know and like which is fine but um pr precisely just this obviously there's lots of controversy around him with like addiction legal issues and media scrutiny but it, it kind of, it's, I'd be remiss to, to not mention that he, exactly what you just said. He quite literally was a child with the world on his shoulders. He's not fully developed yet emotionally or, or mentally. And it's, what, and it's the eighties and he just had access. I think, I think that's the word he had access to all of these things. So, and I, I, I don't know who necessarily is responsible for in situations like that to ensure that, that that someone doesn't go down that path. But I also don't think anybody cared because they were like, we need money. We need him to be. And you know what? It's working. And at the end of the day, everyone was like, but, but as soon as he got home, he was Diego. So I, I don't really know if anyone in the moment was like, wait a minute. <laughs> like, and that's always but, what happens. Yeah. <laughs> yeah absolutely um what about did did either one of you have any just favorite favorite shots i wasn't actually mm. sure in the beginning if this was legitimately him it was when he had the ankle in, ankle injury did they include footage from his actual ankle surgery or was that something else like I, that totally it was definitely a clip of an ankle procedure and i was like if that is him that is so badass if they just like did that right there but did you did you see that in the beginning yeah, yeah, I think That's... that was, I think that was like them showing just how much footage they had of him, and I think it also shows like how important he was, you know, like the fact that in the eighties it's film and they were still like we need to document everything about this guy. Mm. It was a lot of footage and a lot of decent footage too, and um, yeah, it, it it it's it it definitely struck me. I thought it was very um impactful and just. Yeah, I, I thought it was very, very, sorry, very, very smart to, to go that route with all, all of the footage that they that they decided to have. I think it drove home the emotional impact. Um, we can talk a little bit about his personal relationships. Obviously, we saw in the end of the film, just kind of that moment of breakdown and the final moment of like acknowledging his past, his son and, and his mom and all that, which was, it's, it's, that wouldn't have flown today, obviously, but just, that, I thought that was really, interesting i know franny you were kind of talking about that before we hopped on is there anything that that kind of struck you about that whole part uh, i don't know i mean it's kind of like it, it's it's just interesting because i'm somewhat more familiar with him just following him throughout the years and it ends kind of like on a on, at least the movie ends on a happy note in a way but he's kind of like he never really one like he kind of was always kind of back and forth like always having issues and that was kind of like maybe a little win for a bit but then I mean even when he when he passed it was because he had our issues because he was just still doing like drugs and abusing them and, and I don't know it was kind of like the one thing maybe of the movie I didn't enjoy too much that there was like a there's here's that sort of a, of a happy ending you know and it felt kind of like oh I thought we were just ob like observing and then you're kind of pushing something but I, I don't know if that I don't know about the time of the movie that was like the latest thing, you know, like 
there was no more story after that. This was what was happening in the moment. But I think he passed maybe like a year later. Right, he did. Yeah. That's really interesting you say that too, because I also felt that like, I thought we were just spectators. I thought we were just observing things. And it, I didn't necessarily view it as a piece where you were meant to have any type of, any type of a revelation. It's kind of like, if you were familiar enough with his story, nothing was going to shock you about this work. It was just, yes, and. It was just a deeper dive into it with some really, really cool footage, which was great. But at the end of it, it was like, and see. And we're not going to talk about a lot of this stuff, but it, but just see the happy ending. And I was kind of like, all right, like, I don't mind that, but it, it just, it did feel a little forced and contrived. Anthony, what did you think? No, I agree completely. I actually think, Franny, when you and I watched it, I think we, we kind of said that same thing at the end, right? Like, ow. Yeah. Yeah. Because <laughs> it was like, <laughs> and it was, I feel like the filmmaker felt it too, because it's not right at the end, credits happen. And then like 30 seconds into the credits, that scene appears. So I wonder if it's like a, it was like a studio thing where they were like, throw something else in there. Yeah. Have some, yeah, like a little, you know, I don't know. But yeah, I don't know. To uh, me, it's just like, I'm sorry, Franny, go on, I cut you off. Oh, no, keep going. I was going to say my favorite scene, so keep going. No, I, that's what I was going to say. And honestly, like, it, this is going to sound like a generic thing. But again, as somebody who was like new to really seeing this person, like, my favorite scenes were honestly just watching him play. Like, the dude is like a sneak attack missile at times, the way he could move. Like, you know, it's one of these things where, like, there's Diego and there's Maradona. But it just seems to me like the only thing he truly cared about was playing the game. Like, to me, like, that's where he just he was this whole other thing, you know? So, yeah, I, mean, he I, I honestly, and I just, again, seeing him for, for the first, and like, it blew my mind because the only other, well, soccer player I've really seen play is uh, David Beckham. So, you know, anyway. Oh <laughs> but Darn. no, I think you have a good point. Like I will sit down and watch highlight reels from superstar football soccer players. And I, I also just got lost in those sequences. I, I really did enjoy them. And, I thought it was very smart again to have the specific sound bites, even when he, you know he's making a successful play. To so to, you know, the commoner's eye who might not know a lot about soccer, they might think, "Oh, he's so great," but the sound bites would kind of like tear him down a little bit, which is ironic given you know polarizing. This is a god complex. This this man is god. Um, they would always say, you know, he wasn't very good at jumping. He was he had a lot of he never really had any physical um, advantages, but he had strategy and he knew and he was persistent he had perseverance like he fell down he was rolling back up but you know he was like ready to go and just he he saw the goal it was like the ball needs to go in there which i think to he just again this this alternate persona like you cannot mess up you you could almost just see that happening in his body like as as the the footage was just rolling which i thought was really cool but obviously yeah anyone who a little bit more advanced. Like, I, I'm not a professional soccer player, but you just watching, they'd, they'd be able to isolate a lot of mistakes that he made, but he just kept going. So I enjoyed those sequences. Yeah. Uh, Franny, okay. Your favorite scene, Franny. Yeah, my favorite scene was, it's almost towards the end, and it's, I, I, I think it's right after he gets caught after the drug test, and I don't know if he's still at Napoli or is this final, like, mm -hmm. couple months, but it's a Christmas party. And the camera sees him at a table and then it, it I think it's like the longest like shot I've seen in the movie where it doesn't cut away to anything. But you just watch his face and you get slower and slower, closer in. And you just see him in thought. And to me, that was like the moment where he was kind of just lost. He fully let go of Diego. And like that was to me the moment Maradona took over. Cause you see him like almost internally fighting, and it's like a Christmas party. There's family, it's all this, but he's like, I don't know. It just I don't know. It felt like a scripted scene, and it was just really cool to see mm -hmm. that documented because mm -hmm. you know, i wonder like who was filming that and me I, like in my house i'm always the person filming at like my family parties and i'm like who saw that like who saw that who in his family was like what's going on through diego's head right now and why did they only record it and not say something you know like so that was my favorite scene <laughs> nice. did you have a favorite scene anthony well, no, it was, I, yeah, it was the the playing of the soccer. Yeah. Oh, that that, was, okay, so that was your yeah, yeah. Okay. Sorry. Um, but yeah, no, it's just, um, it's, I'm kind of thinking now about this, about the whole, like, he's a God thing, you know, and you think about, like, I'm, my mind is literally going to Ted Lasso and, like, people, uh, mm -hmm. what is it? Uh, 
Who's the character who says football is life? Who is that? Um, oh, Danny, Danny Rojas. Yeah. Uh, but, you know, you think about some of these countries where it is like they just eat, breathe, sleep, you know, football. Uh, and like, I think Diego Mordona is kind of like a perfect example of, you know, an idol that they worship at the altar of. Like, if, if you worship soccer, this is your God. Like, that is it. You know, like, it, it kind of makes perfect sense. Like, if, if the soccer is a religion, this is our God. You know, like that. And just, yeah. So, you know, in, in Argentina, they actually have a religion based off Diego Maradona. There's like a small, I should have sent it to you guys, but there's a smaller documentary on YouTube. It's like 10 minutes. And it's following this religion. And it's like a couple members. They have like a small church. But it's like, yeah, it's insane. Like, And I well, I told you both when my parents went to Italy last year. And they just, all of the, I don't even know what, what to call it. Just like the iconic, you know, the just worship material of, mm -hmm. of him in, in Naples. But Anthony, I, th I think you're absolutely right. Just he's he was a human being and his natural ability whether you he was just passionate about the people he was doing it for or as a football player you 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 can't live up to this you cannot be worshipped it's not you cannot sustain a healthy life while doing this and he struggled he so many things you know people like to focus on what he did but yeah. also just like media intrusion nations just hatred just you know yeah. and the privacy aspect of it just mobs and and that i'm not saying like obviously this is why he did the thing but it just i think it was to me a bigger commentary on humans are human beings and mm. it was a complete product of them themselves because that's what they wanted they wanted yeah. to create someone to have that type of success to bring in to to save them from mm. poverty and what's that word save so he was a savior he was a god you know and then when you know he uh, turns out the man behind the curtain isn't the wizard of oz like it's it's just kind of everyone's like well how dare he you know it, it's it's kind of contradictory and, and sad but um an interesting life lesson he was still epic he was still a great football player yeah, yeah. do we want to talk about like the women in his life or anything like oh, gosh. you know i i don't want to like make this like dark or anything but yeah i mean do we want i have will any... say you know controversy aside acknowledgement of relationships aside press aside i really did enjoy some of that footage of his just romantic life i the slow dancing and the kissing like so intimate like again excellent footage it wasn't just like hey i'm trying to be invasive it was just it was very artistic and intentional mm -hmm. and i thought that was very lovely personally that's what i'll say about that yeah Okay. All right. Franny, you want to say anything? <laughs> um, hmm. Oh, I, I will. I, I think it's really interesting, like, how, like, this still, like, it's from the 80s, but I think, uh, like, the message kind of this movie, it relates a lot. It's even a lot more important to now, like, the idea of, like, how obsessed people are with celebrities now like it's even worse you know like people like the way people are wor worshiping maradona that wasn't really happening everywhere but now that's everywhere like people love celebrities like it's so yeah. weird and, and i think like i don't know it's also like one of those things like a lot i think now we are like a lot more judgmental you know because we are just like so quickly seeing this but I, I don't know. I think if more people saw this movie, you would understand how like it is difficult to grow up always in front of the camera. And now and now, like more generations are going to keep growing up always in front of the camera. You know, like I mean, like kids growing up now, like their thoughts, that stuff they tweet, stuff they put out on the internet, it's going to be forever out there. And I'm like, how can you blame someone for not thinking straight at 13? Like that's also awful, you know. And I I think we should have some sort of I don't know something I guess in school where you kind of just train people on how to use social media, the internet and this movie yeah. kind of shows that like you can't just judge someone. Yeah. It's so interesting that you just said that because one, yeah, media has absolutely changed it, the, the, um, what's the confidence that people get behind keyboards in general. And it's, it's also, you know, it's easy to just say people need to have thicker skin. There is the article in the times with all of these school teachers who were essentially being cyber bullied by these students. Um, acting like them on TikTok accounts or something to that to that effect but um I would just did, I just did this training today talking about you know online classrooms and, 
and why that's important to go over community guidelines and tell people what it is to be an upstanding online citizen. And while that sounds so like preachy and oh my God, we go through this. It is important because these are learned behaviors. And when younger people, especially again, frontal lobe, not, not fully developed, having access to these dangerous things, arguably, um, back in my day, we didn't, you know, like it's, it, it, it's I, I hate social media, but yet I love social media and just media in general. Um, you know, we were talking about the, the, the home derby national anthem earlier today with, oh geez, with that country singer and, and how, yes, it's funny to kind of make fun of something. And then she had this whole big post about how she was drunk and she checked herself into a facility, which also garnered a lot of like feedback of like, is that really what's going on? But then, you know, on the flip side, well, we can't be judging people if they're struggling. It, it doesn't, it's something for people to comment on. I think that's what it is. People are bored and this is how we now thrive. This is how we ingest information. And this is how we get attention because when we write a funny comment or when we pass a judgment that is um, controversial, people react to it. People feed into it because that's that's just the ecosystems that we have created. And I hate it, but also I like memes. So it's hard, right? It's really, it's really difficult, but um. Yeah. Anything else about this film anyone wanted to share? Well, you know, it's funny, though. I just want to say, like, going back to everything about, like, how, like, the media shaped him into this person and maybe in a way kind of caused his downfall in a sense. Like, I was looking this up because we were, I said, maybe I thought this director also did uh, The Princess, the Princess Diana movie based off the way the footage was shown. But actually, similar to the media affecting a person, um, this director actually did uh, the Amy Winehouse biopic, Amy, which won Best Documentary in uh, 2015. And, you know, uh, I definitely see a lot of parallels there in terms of, you know, just you were saying this, Alexander, just like the way the media treats you and how what, what that can do to your psyche. I mean, you know, especially if you're a pop star, you know, they want you to be a certain way. Look this way, say this, do that, do that. And, you know, Amy, like Diego, I'm not trying to, this will not become an Amy Winehouse thing, but like, you know she had demons wanted to be a certain way wanted a certain kind of respect and it's like yeah and I, you know that's it so i just I, I was just i'm just saying that i think this director knows how to tell stories like this he knows how to find this kind of flawed character you know um yeah so um but no i i i love the film very much uh and just they they put they went from 500 hours of footage that's what i read and put it down into this 2 hour and 10 minute movie and i got to say that 2 hours and 10 minutes like you learned a lot but like the movie yeah. flew like a lot happened in 2 hours and 10 minutes so you know i think when it ended i was like oh wow that's it but yeah i i thought yeah so i arguably i could have watched more of it and i think yeah. it's it was linear but not linear i don't know what i'm trying to say here it it um it progressed very, very well. And again, because it, it was just like watching footage. And I that that sounds so simple to kind of reduce documentaries to that. But that's that's what it was. And that that's kind of like the little insight that I feel like people also crave too, right? Like they're they don't want like the glossy interviews with celebrities. They want to see them interact with with their with their in their in their personal relationships and whatnot, which see again seems a little intrusive. But um Still, I, I I did think it was very well done, and I really did enjoy it. Yeah. No. Okay. Is there anything else you want to say about the film? Do we want to talk about the series a little bit? What we have coming up, or anything like that? Um, well, I mean, just trying to think, like maybe like some final words on D the, on the film. Uh, <laughs> you know, um, but no, just like again, having really honestly like i kind of learned everything i've ever known about diego lardona the other day thanks franny um you know um i just yeah now that i know this is the director of amy and just kind of seeing the parallels like it, diego's a presence that's gonna stay in my head that's all i'm gonna say so yeah but i i, I love the movie and would watch it again and your thought about like it could have been longer I think this could have been like a four or five hour like mini series, like maybe like five one hour episodes or something, like a docu series. Like I think that could have been cool. But I mean, the movie, like the movie ends when he leaves Napoli, and it kind of like the way it, it like slow it ends, it makes you think that that's kind of the end of his career. But he, he does play on for like another decade mm -hmm. after in Argentina, and then he actually goes on and coaches the Argentinian team, and I, I think he took him to like the quarterfinals. Mm -hmm. It's also like he does have like a. 
pretty interesting life after too. And then he coached uh, the greatest player ever, Messi. But yes, I think. Oh, sorry, my cat. Oh my goodness, uh, she's very passionate about football. Um, I think my final thoughts are just you know, documentaries don't have to be those flashy, dramatic Netflix, you know, talking head interviews dramatic close-ups it can there's a lot to be said by just sitting down going through 500 hours worth of archived materials and just telling a story with with what presents itself I think that there's something valuable in that and I think it lends itself very well to storytelling and it's effective so yeah yeah and it also kind of makes you remember that your your own life is like there's a story in your own life you know like you watch this person's life but other than him being like a super famous soccer player he kind of went through normal things too like relationships you know and it's just like oh yeah i guess my own life is a story too it's mm -hmm. just not at a certain level but and I just connecting to like this remind you of that for sure sorry i cut you off but the just connecting to the specific time period too like there was something so the fact that the only interviews that you really got in this were from the footage that they had and just seeing um someone lying in bed and then they just lean over with this giant microphone like that I was just like we're in the 80s you know it was it was really really cool and I and I don't think I would have had that type of a positive response had they they took taken a different approach of just like I'm gonna talk about it today and then let's flash back to this sequence so um again I just I just think it was really effective yeah, yeah and also, even oh, go go on. On. no I, I'm sorry yeah no I, I was just literally gonna say really quick like also doing it that way kind of because it's happening in the moment makes like if you had pulled the person interviewing them all these years later, their interpretation of the scene could have changed. And when that happened and, you know, you don't get any, you get the absolute like no opinion based subject, like this is it. So objectively, this is what happened. So, but anyway, Franny, I've back to you. No, yeah. Now, so uh, I realized what, what they did to keep us like in the moment was the score. It was very, very like eighties electronic, uh, like synth wave. And I think that was something like, even when montages were happening, it was like kind of like this is how people were experiencing this in the moment you know like i imagine i, I imagine like it, when you're in the 80s and you know when napoli's winning all these trophies year after year it was probably incredible and i guarantee those people who were experiencing that and going to the, all those games week after week they're like wow those years flew by you know because when something's good happening it just goes by so quickly so i think it's interesting that the score kind of matched up with that and it was like yeah they're people's lives were kind of like that. They would probably go week after week watching a game, go to work, go to a club and listen to this type of music, go back to a game and years pass by. Yeah. Wow. Do we get, we should get a sequel is what I think. We won't, but you know, it would have been cool. Um, give us the other three hours worth of. I mean, well, there's 500 hours of footage. So like, you know, but obviously no, I do think centering this around uh you know where it did i think made the most sense so yeah um all right uh let's talk about our series let's talk about some upcoming stuff we have alessandra franny what do we have coming up sure so uh well to stay on we do have we do have a free screening all of our screenings are free we do have an upcoming screening on the 26th of july at 7 p.m that will be time crimes um, i'll talk about the the first two and then maybe for any of you want to talk about the next two um so we're super excited about that if you like the idea of time travel but um if you like this movie talk we also are going to be back on the 20th of august 7 30 p.m to talk about gotta kick it up which is a disney channel original movie and if you haven't seen it and you have disney plus you should check it out uh, um, Al alessandra did i told you that i've actually never seen the movie why anthony I where have you been well, no, You've listen. seen the 13th year, though, so that's it's, that's fine. Yeah, but, but no, through, through years of my life, I've seen, like, bits and pieces of it on TV. I could probably tell you what happened. Si puede. Yeah, you got to watch it. Yeah. It's really great. And well, I'm going to now. So we're going to have a great conversation. So Make this finally happen for me. So, Franny, do you want to talk about any either of those, or do you want to talk about what we have coming up in October and November, then? Yeah, I'll mention what's coming up. So then October 9th, we have Pan Labyrinth, and we're celebrating Guillermo del Toro's 60th birthday, which is crazy but yeah that should be a good time and then november 2nd we have coco which yeah, is gonna be, it's gonna be an incredible time 
Uh, also, we do partner with Hispanics Center Lehigh Valley for all of our screenings. So if you come to a screening and you want to assist and uh, benefit their food pantry, they are accepting items. So we have that listed on our website. So basically non-perishable items, goods, um, specifically around back to school time, they do take school supplies as well. So we'll have like collection bins or, or a box or something like that. And then we bring it over to their organization was actually pretty close to Frank Banco. So you should definitely look into that. It's a wonderful organization. They have really fun and exciting programming as well. We're proud to partner with them. And if you check us out on steelstacks.org, there's a button that you can add your, and you might be actually watching this from, from the website to subscribe to our newsletter. We don't over solicit. We just kind of give you information about upcoming programming and screenings and you're, or you're watching this on the Facebook page. So the next step would just be to like the Facebook page if you haven't yet, Frank Banco LL Cinemas, or you might be watching it on YouTube, depending on when this gets posted. So ah, make sure ah. you're subscribed to that channel. And then you can just, you can just say so connected with us and with all the cool things that we have coming up.